Welcome back to Computer Science 4300. Today, we have one of my favorite lectures of the term, which is um, talking about optimizations for memory uh, for ECS systems. So we will tell a bit of a story when it comes to cache coherency and then talk about how you can use memory pooling for ECS and how that can make uh, things much, much faster for us, like a surprising amount faster. Uh, and just as a reminder, if you are watching this on the day that uh, this lecture is supposed to come out, uh, so this is being recorded on Monday, the 15th, but is being released on Tuesday, the 16th. So that is due 11.59 on the 16th. So if you're watching this and you haven't submitted this yet, uh, please get on that. I've only got four submissions so far, and that should look like about 20 or 25 by everything said and done. So make sure you're getting that submitted to me. All right, uh, with that said, let's get into the lecture for the day. All right, so today we're gonna to be talking about game performance, uh, CPU caching and memory profiling. So all really fun stuff. That's not directly going to be tested in any way in the course. But hopefully, as programmers interested in game programming, you'll pay attention to this because if you want performant games, it turns out that organizing your memory may actually be the most important thing in your game. So there's many factors that determine the overall performance of your game. Uh, with ECS, we can it's really nice using ECS because you can profile the systems independently and determine which are bottlenecking the speed. So for example, you may have bottlenecks such as like the physics, the AI, the rendering, the ray casting system, stuff like that. And with ECS, it's really nice because we've actually built a game engine in which we have all of the movement code in one function and all of the physics in another function, all of the AI in another function. So what you can actually do is you can turn on or off functions in order to um, profile them. And it's really easy to just say, okay, the AI system is taking up the majority of our time or the physics system is taking up the majority of our time because we've compartmentalized everything um, to the point where we can really easily say, you know, uh, the AI is doing this and the physics is doing this. And there are lots of tools out there uh, for doing this sort of benchmarking and profiling. And actually in a future lecture, I'm going to go into detail um, in how we can make something that sort of looks like this from scratch, which is really interesting. Um, so for example, we'll be able to see like exactly how much time each of our functions are taking. Um, so we can say, oh, look, this, you know, this part of our frame is taking up 10 milliseconds. It should probably only be one millisecond. So we'll drill down into that. Um, and, and try and optimize things a little better. So that, this, this part of it will be in a future lecture. However, I just wanted to include a few um, videos here on um, profiling so that you can start using those tools if you want to. So for example, uh, if you want to produce uh, visualizations of how long your stuff takes like this within Visual Studio, you can do that. And so there's a video here that shows you how to do that. And uh, there'll be more in, uh, in the next lecture for this stuff. But in this lecture, we're gonna talk about um, mostly memory optimizations, okay? So there may be non-obvious performance hits that are coming in your, um, in your games and in your game engines. So it's really easy as a programmer, especially one who has come through a, an academic computer science degree, to think that the only things that affect performance are algorithms and mathematics, right? So all throughout your CS degree, you're taught that the big O running notation is all that matters and everything else is just a detail, right? So if your code runs in N squared time and there's another code that runs in uh, N time, that's literally all that matters. And it turns out that's, that's not the case whatsoever. Okay, so this is a fourth year computer science course, and this lecture is going to teach you that everything you've learned so far in computer science has pretty much been a lie, and almost the only thing that matters is, is like cache coherency. So, however, that, that was a bit of a joke, um, but it is very true that if you take like an n squared algorithm and you change it to log n, 
you can save a ton of time, right? Something that used to be like a million operations, that's now a thousand operations. Obviously, that's a huge thing, right? However, in practice, oftentimes the implementation matters more than the running time, okay? So the implementation of conceptually simple things can impact our performance even more than algorithmic things, okay? And I'm not going to get into this too much, but there are actually some, you know, really fancy algorithms that end up using data structures that are so slow that the big O of N running time doesn't even help you. But we're not going to get into that right now. So, important optimizations. First and foremost, yes, you do want to use more efficient algorithms. If it has a very clear runtime benefit, like you wouldn't use bubble sort over quick sort, right? You're not going to use n squared when n log n can do that. That sort of stuff is pretty obvious. And that the algorithms is where your computer science degree, right? Or equivalent degree is going to help you. Um, but this is also where computer science stops, right? You just graduate and you think uh, big O notation, that's all that matters. So however I implement it, is going to, that is just gonna work, right? But that is not the case whatsoever. Um, the next important optimization, obviously, is to minimize the size of your data structures. If you can get by using a kilobyte of memory instead of a megabyte of memory, that's just an, that's an obvious implementa implementation um, thing that you wanna do, is to, is to use as little memory as possible. Also, something that's not so obvious is code reuse and modularity. Because believe it or not, games have to be finished, right? Programs actually have to be written and finished somehow. And if you're rewriting a bunch of code all over the place, um, it, it's, uh, it takes so much more time that maybe now you don't have time to do the optimizations that you wanted to, right? So code reuse is important, not only for like speed and ease of implementation, but as we'll see, if you use like modular reusable code in your, in your game engine or in game programming, if you implement an optimization within those modules and then you use those modules everywhere, then you've, you've made your code more efficient everywhere, right? Rather than um, like writing sort of one-off ad hoc code everywhere, if you wanted to optimize all of that, you would have to go optimize it over here, optimize it over here, optimize it over here. But what we've shown in this course is stuff like our entity manager factory, right? So if we make optimizations to our entity manager, all of those uh, systems that use the entity manager will be optimized just now because they use the entity manager. And so being, being really modular and, and using object-oriented programming correctly uh, can help us a lot when it comes to optimizations. And minimizing dynamic heap allocations is going to be something that we talk about in a second. Um, but as I talked about before, minimizing dynamic heap allocations or dynamic heap allocations are very expensive. And so we're going to show something called memory pooling, which can help minimize the amount of dynamic memory allocations that we make. And also we want to write cache friendly code. Okay. And this is sometimes called data oriented design or data oriented programming, where we spend a lot of time and effort in organizing our code and organizing our data such that it's contiguous in memory in the way that we want and we have cache friendly code now. So I'll go into details about that a bit later in the lecture. So uh, use more efficient algorithms. This is obvious, right? This is your whole computer science degree is talking about algorithms. What we're gonna talk about in this lecture are these four things, right? So minimizing data structure size. C++ is great because it gives us really fine control over the size of the data structures that we use for games. So depending on a, uh, deciding on a size type for your data uh, depends entirely on the context for your game, your structure, uh, your functions, uh, how much memory you have, etc. Minimizing data structure size can help you in many, many different ways in your program. So first of all, the obvious one is reducing size uses less memory, 
right? So the obvious benefit of that is less RAM usage. So you're using up less resources of the, the end user of the program, and that's good. Also, another benefit is that a reduced size for your data structures is less time sending and copying data in your program. So not only do you use less RAM, but your program will be faster as well. So if data needs to be copied in your program, this can dramatically speed up times, right? For example, if you need to copy a vector of large data, that's gonna take a lot longer than copying a, a vector of small data, if you have to copy a vector for some reason. And if you can somehow get all of your data down below or equal to or less than eight bytes, then you can pass everything by value instead of by reference. And passing like small data by value eliminates that extra dereferencing step that can help speed up your uh, your program. And so it, it eliminates that, that dereference call or a pointer call where before you were passing pointers or references, now you can pass uh, by value and it, it makes things faster. All right. So here's just a, just a small example of that. Let's say we have this uh, 64 by 64 game world, right? Um, if our game world is 64 by 64, then um, let's say we're trying to store our character's location in that game world. Well, we don't necessarily need to use a full integer to store the X and the Y value of the player. Right? So before we had like four bytes for an integer for the X value, four bytes for an integer for the Y value. Maybe um, we only need something like a char or an unsigned char where before we were using an int, right? So maybe one optimization we could do is we could take this eight bytes that we were previously using. So two integers to store the X, Y location. And now we're reducing that eight bytes down to two bytes, right? Because we're using a, a, a byte for an X and a byte for the Y. So that simple example, our data to store where the player is or where an entity is, has gone from eight bytes down to two bytes. That's pretty good. However, I've chosen this example very carefully because that could be a premature optimization. So with all of these optimizations that I'm telling you, the most important rule is get everything working first, okay? So don't optimize before you have a working prototype. Get your slow working prototype up and running. Now you can optimize some things, we're not gonna get into to, to that, that too much, but make sure everything works and then come back and turn eight bytes into two bytes. Because what if halfway through the development of your system, you thought you were being really clever by using chars instead of ints here, but then your, your team lead comes and says, oh, we're gonna have um, maps that are size 1000 by 1000 now. And so you have to go back and you have to change all, change all your chars to shorts or something like that. Um, so keep in mind that you can reduce um, the data size for some of your variables, but that may be a premature optimization that later on you would have to change. So there's always this trade-off between um, minimizing data size and maximizing usability, for example. But only start optimizing once all of your implementation, all of your functionality is, is in the game. Okay, so code reuse and modularity. We've talked about this a bit before in the course. Um, any time when you have reusable code, put it into its own function. Inline that function if you have to, but just put it into its own function. That way, if later on you ever find some optimizations that you can do for that piece of code, you put the optimizations in the function, and now everywhere you call that function, you're using the optimized code, okay? That may not seem, like, that, that might seem obvious, but sometimes it's it's not so obvious when it came to something like an entity manager, for example, right? So if you had never seen that factory pattern before for using an entity manager, maybe what you would have done is just created entities on the fly as you go. Maybe you would put them into some vector, for example. But later on, if you found of some other way to like create them more efficiently, for example, um, then what you would have to do is you would have to optimize your code every single place that you were creating entities. However, now because you have the entity manager, all you'd have to do is optimize that add entity function, 
And then since we're forcing everyone to use the add entity function, um, then your code will be optimized everywhere just because we forced you to be using that modular reusable code. So in the entity manager, we use this all the time. And the good thing is maybe at your company, you have one person working on the gameplay mechanics and you have one person working on uh, the entity manager, right? The storage and the, of the data and the entities. The person working on the game mechanics doesn't even have to change their code if you've optimized the entity manager. Because all the person doing the, the game mechanics knows is that I can add an entity, right? So not only does it help you improve the efficiency of your code, but by compartmentalizing and making things modular, you've also made it easier to use your optimized code, right? So that, that real human cost of making your code usable should also be considered an optimization, in my opinion. So any, optimiza any optimizations that are underneath that entity manager framework are invisible above it. So anyone using it just knows, oh, wow, my program is like twice as fast now. How did that happen? I didn't change any of my code, but um, below the hood, it has been changed and you didn't even know it. Uh, someone in the chat says reduced cognitive uh, code as well. Um, yeah, so that just means that by keeping things compartmentalized, you like, let's say we didn't have an entity manager. Every single time you wanted to create an entity, you would have to think about things like, okay, what was the code to create an entity again? Where do I have to store that? Is it stored by index? Is it stored by whatever? And so it, it reduces the number of things you need to think about as well. All right. The next thing is minimizing dynamic allocations. So dynamic heap allocations are very expensive. Uh, they call malloc under the hood, which is the C memory allocation library, which is operating system dependent, okay? And what it does is malloc goes out and it tries to find a contiguous block of memory of a given size, and then it returns you a pointer to that contiguous block of memory. Um, but given the complexities of your computer's memory layout, it's, it's way, way slower than using stack allocated things. Okay, so as I showed before, this is how malloc works. It's like a huge number of if statements and operating system like specific things. And then when you want to free memory, it has its own like flow chart of logic that it has to go through. Um, when you reallocate memory inside a vector, it's really slow. And so ideally what we would have is just one big chunk of memory that we keep track of that we can add things and remove things very, very quickly that would not have to go through any of this process, okay? And when we think about, is this a video? I'm not sure, one second. Yeah, so this is like our engine for assignment three and using the memory pool that I'm about to show you, like it's no trouble to be able to create and delete thousands and thousands of entities per frame without any sort of slowdown, right? If you used our current engine to try and do something like this, and my, my bit rate, I'm sure, has completely gone down here, but what you're seeing is something like 30,000 entities being created per second um, with no slowdown whatsoever in the engine. And this sort of thing is possible if you do it correctly. All right. And it's possible because of something called memory pooling. All right, yeah, someone told me, yeah, I'm like eight pixels. So apologize, I, I'm, I'm sure that that's probably, let me just put that up. So this was a bunch of bullets being fired in our assignment three framework, okay? So that, that's what that was, but I'm sure that uh, the number of things moving caused uh, me to be a bit blurry. So heap memory is slower to allocate, but stack memory is too limited, right? We only have a megabyte or two sometimes with our stack memory. So what we could do is let's allocate a large chunk of heap memory at the start of the program. So we're gonna take a bunch of memory and we're gonna say, okay, that gigabyte of memory or hundred megabytes or megabyte or however much we want, we've allocated that once at the start. And what we're going to do is we're going to use only that memory during the runtime of our game. And that's called memory pooling. So you set up this huge pool of memory that you're allowed to use 
um, during the runtime of your game. And what this does is you have one big allocation at the start. Maybe, you know, your initial loading screen or whatever. You say, go give me that memory. And then you have that memory to use um, during the runtime of your program. And so you no longer have to make any of these uh, expensive heap allocations during the runtime of your program. However, this does add to the complexity of managing the memory pool and where we put new objects, right? So before we were just saying, hey, alloc, like malloc, give me some new memory, um, make me a new, uh, or we were actually shared pointer was doing that for us, right? So shared pointer entity would go out, it would find memory for us, it would allocate the entity there, and then it would give us this pointer to that. Now that was easy to use, but it was slow, right? It's it's not so slow that we can't use it in our course. You can keep using that in our course, no problem. But it is much slower than, than what we can do. However, with with great power comes great responsibility, right? So now what we have to do is we have to manage our memory so that we are like manually saying where we want these things to go now. And I'll come back to memory pooling in a little bit after I've explained just a little bit about cache coherency. So what is cache coherency? Writing cache friendly code is one of the most important speed optimizations in practice whenever you're programming. Whenever data is fetched from RAM, what happens is, and this is a big hand wavy magic way of saying it, not like if I'm looking up a value in an array, right? Not only does my CPU get that value, but in the cache, some surrounding values are also stored, okay? So if I look up, uh, let's say I'm looking up index i in an integer array, not only did I get index i, but maybe I also got index i plus one, i plus two, and i plus three, for example. And so those are in the cache. So if I go to look up one of those things, it will be much faster the next time I go to look at it. So the cache memory is much, much faster. It's physically closer to the CPU. However, it's much smaller than normal RAM, right? So, you know, we may have kilobytes um, or even bytes of specific types of cache memory. So if we organize our frequently used data to be contiguous in memory, it allows us to fetch more of that data on each lookup. And whenever we look up something that's not in the cache, but it's, it's you know, we look it up in RAM, but it's not in the cache, we call that a cache miss because it's not in the cache, so we have to bypass the cache to go all the way to memory. So here is sort of what that looks like. We've got our main memory all the way over here, and we've got our CPU all the way over here right? So between the CPU and the main memory, we have a cache controller and we have some cache memory, right? We have, there's many different types of cache memory and I'm not getting into all that right now, but essentially what happens is whenever the CPU says, give me this bit of data, right? The very first time it's accessed, it has to go to the main memory because we have never looked it up before. But what happens is that memory passes, passes back through the cache controller and some data surrounding the initial address that we looked up is stored in the cache. So next time the CPU looks up something that was close to the previous thing we looked up, it can get it directly from the cache instead of having to go all the way back to the main memory. Okay. And, you know, you may say, well, electricity, you know, it, it goes pretty fast um, at the speed of light, but even still the, the physical way that the cache and the memory is constructed and the materials that it are made out of and how it is actually organized make the cache memory much, much faster. How much faster? Why does this matter, Dave? Stop talking about the cache. Give me some examples. Well, looking something up in memory can take 200 cycles, for example. Okay, so this is like from like a standard machine a couple of years ago. Things may have changed. Don't quote me on these exact things. But as of a couple of years ago, when I first wrote this slide, this was still pretty accurate. So if you look up something in RAM and it's not in the cache, that can take you 200 cycles. Versus if you look it up and it's in the cache, it might be one or two cycles, 
Okay, these are clock cycles of your CPU. One multiplication is three cycles. So you could potentially do 65 multiplications of data in the same time that it actually took you to look up that data, right? If it's not cached. So if you're just going through and you're multiplying some data, you might think, oh, well, you know, this algorithm has twice as many multiplies as the other algorithm, therefore it should take twice as long. But if the one with half the multiplies has more cache misses, then it might be 65 times slower, right? It's, it's crazy how much this ends up mattering. And here's a, tan uh, here's a very tangible example of that. So this is from a website that I list on the next slide. Um, this is an example. So memory access and performance. How much faster do you expect loop two to run compared to loop one? So let's look at what happens here. So we're going to set up uh, this array. So this is an integer array and it's 64 times 124 time, or sorry, 1024 times 1024. So this is a kilobyte, a megabyte, 64, 64 million integers. Okay. So this is an array of 64 million integers. Loop number one goes through each of these and all it does is it takes each inter the integer in the array and multiplies it by three, okay? So it goes through all 64 million integers and multiplies it by three. The second loop, instead of multiplying every single integer by, by, um, by three, it skips 16 integers at a time, okay? So it'll do the first one, so it'll do i equals zero, then it adds 16, then it does the 16th, then it does the 32nd, then it does the 48th, then it does the 64, okay? So this is, this one is multiplying every single array index by three. This one is multiplying every 16th index by three. So how much time do you think uh, how much more time does loop two take versus loop one? Now, be honest with your answer. Obviously, I'm showing you this because there's like a trick to it, but you'd think that this or that like this loop is is doing one sixteenth the actual work. It's doing one sixteenth the multiplies of loop one, so it should be you know theoretically, if we were to look at analyze this algorithm it would take 1 16th the time of loop one. But it turns out loop two does 6% of the multiplication work, but it takes the exact same amount of time. Why is that? The reason it takes the same amount of time is because, and this, is a, this, this example is constructed specifically for this, is that one integer is four bytes. Typically your fastest cache memory will be fetching 64 bytes at a time. So 64 divided by four is 16. So every time you look up something in the cache here, you're getting that integer in the array and the next 15 of them, right? So what happens here is you have one cache miss every 16 multiplies, but the multiplies aren't the bottleneck, right? We saw here, that you might be able to do 65 multiplications for every cache miss. So what's happening here is that you're doing 1 16th of the multiplies, but because the next thing that you fetch is 64 bytes away, it's always going to be a cache miss. So you've got the same number of cache misses in both of these loops, and it turns out the cache miss is the bottleneck and so they take approximately the same amount of time. So if we look at this value here, so in this one, uh, let's introduce a variable called k. And k is the number of integers that we're going to skip between multiplies. So if k was equal to two, we'd be doing every second one. If k was equal to four, we'd be doing every fourth one. Here, k is equal to 16, okay? Let's look at this graph. If we update every kth integer, this is the amount of time that it takes, all right? So 
1 through 16 all have the same number of cache misses, right? So it's not until you go past 16 where you're doing far less work to the point where you're getting fewer cache misses, right? So here, for example, when we updated every 16th, we were getting a cache miss every time. When we do 32, we're still getting a cache miss every time, but we're only doing half of the multiplies of k equals 16, right? So we've sort of gotten the maximum number of cache misses up here until we go down and we do every 64th, 128, 256. So you can see from this diagram that, yeah, so someone in the chat said, so greater than 16, you're doing so few operations that the cache misses don't add up. They still add up, we're just doing fewer of them, right? Because K equals 16 is where we have this worst case scenario where we're looking basically at all the data in the cache, but we're always getting cache misses. And since there's always cache misses here and always cache misses here, except here you have half the operations, then that's why it's approximately half the running time, okay? So here's just a slide on what I just said. Memory access dominates the running time of that function that we just showed. So the cache will grab 64 bytes at a time, which is 16 integers. Loop one has one normal lookup and 15 cache, looked up, cache lookups. And so the lookup time for example one, for k equal to one, is, is almost free lookup for, for most of the thing, for most of the lookups. Loop two has one normal lookup, but one sixteenth of them. And so it has similar memory access time because it has the same number of cache misses. And the multiplications are pipelined anyway, right? So it doesn't even matter. I'm not gonna get into what pipelining is, but essentially in this loop here, because the next loop doesn't depend on the previous loop, the compiler and the processor basically do tons of these multiplies in parallel anyway. Okay, they're all technically not parallel, but they are pipelines. So some of them are started before the other ones are finished. And the compiler and the CPU are smart enough to do that. All right, so those examples um, were taken from this article. So if you're more, if you're interested in, in learning about that example, or if you didn't quite get it, uh, there's, there's a good explanation of it on this website. And uh, there's a YouTube video here called uh, Data Oriented Design in C++ Writing Cache Friendly C++ Code. That's a really good article. So cache friendly data structures. In order to avoid cache misses, you want to store data contiguously in memory. Arrays and vectors store data contiguously in memory but certain other data structures do not. So for example, some lists, sets, maps, and dictionaries do not store data contiguously in memory. Um, and the one of the worst offenders of all of this are linked lists. Because linked lists often have, well, the data structure we've been shown in our classes is that a linked list has a pointer to the next node. So there's a node structure, it's made up of a list of node structures, and we allocate those nodes on the heap, and then this node points to that node and has some data. But because they're all, act, like, they're all sort of randomly allocated on the heap, then every time we go through a linked list, we're getting a cache miss every time. Okay, now there are some implementations of linked lists that are implemented contiguously, but they're few and far between. And so just use a vector or an array where it is physically possible, all right? Use a vector or an array if you can, because the data is guaranteed to be contiguous. However, as a note, a vector is a dynamically sized array. When a vector is filled up, it creates a new, larger, temporary array, and then it copies everything over to the new array. To avoid vector resizing, what you can do is you can reserve an amount of space equal to some maximum size. So what this means is, let's just try and draw a little diagram here on the screen. So let's say that I create a new vector, and I've got a new vector, and it's like this. And maybe whatever algorithm we use, 
um, there's going to be four spaces for data in that vector. Okay. So um, we add something into here. It goes here. We add another thing. It goes here. We add another thing. It goes here. We add another thing. It goes there. Now, if we want to add another thing to that vector, what it does under the hood is it creates a second temporary vector of a larger size. Okay. So let's say it doubles in size every time. So now we've got eight spaces. It takes these four entries and copies them into these four entries. And now when we insert something else, it goes here. And so this happens all the time. Okay. So if you, let's say you have a vector and you just create a vector and you add a thousand things to it, that vector over the course of adding a thousand things may have had to resize itself anywhere between five and 20 times. Okay. So that is, that ends up making it very slow. So what you can do is you can reserve data. So let's say I know that I'm going to have a vector and that vector is going to have uh, at most a thousand things in it. Then what I can do is I can tell my vector to reserve space for a thousand things so that when it's created, it will have a thousand indices in it or a space for a thousand indices. So when I keep putting things in the vector, it will not resize, right? So we want to make sure our vector is as big as we want it to start off. And, and again, what that does, there's always a trade-off between speed and memory, right? So the benefit of growing as you add things is that you're always going to have sort of the minimally sized list or the minimally sized vector. So if we only ever have four things in the vector, then it will only ever be of maximum size four. But if we want a thousand things in the vector and it keeps resizing, that's really slow. So you can trade space by initially having the vector be as large as we could possibly have it. And then putting things in it will not slow things down. Okay. So by reserving, it will use a single malloc at the beginning. It will use whatever RAM you want immediately. And then insertions into that vector won't resize it until we like, until we get to some really, really uh, big thing. So I had a couple of questions. Someone says, um, in what situation would we use a linked list? I will tell you right now that in 20 years of using C++, I have never used a linked list. I have never had to use a linked list. Um, linked list have some nice properties, theoretical properties of constant time insert, constant time delete. Okay. So if you need a list in which you are constant time inserting and deleting of things very often, it is possible that a linked list may help you, but I have not come across a single example in 20 years where I actually wanted to use a linked list. So that, that's just me. Maybe other people have come across one, but my rule is just, you would have to convince me very hard that you should, that you should use a linked list for anything ever. Just use a vector don't or an array. Um, yeah, so that's, that's all I'm going to answer right now. Okay. So when we talk, when I say, you know, okay, just use a vector. What do I mean about just use a vector? Well, there's different ways that we can store data in a vector, right? So let's say the, the, the first option is to just store a vector of raw data like a, vent a vector of integers, for, exa for example, is a vector of raw data. Or if I had some data structure which contained like uh, 20 integers, right? Then I could store a vector of that data structure. So storing the raw data, if you will, in the vector will make sure that that data lives contiguously in memory. And so raw data can be large, right? Um, so it's more expensive to copy. So for example, if we have a use case where we have a vector of data and we oftentimes want to move data around inside that vector, then it may be that the copying of the data is the bottleneck to our time, right? So let's say our data structure is a megabyte. It's something pretty big. The vector stores that on the heap, so it's fine. We've got the data for it. But if we are doing like a sorting algorithm, 
for example, let's say we're looking at bubble sort. Bubble sort is going to be constantly switching this data from this index to this index. So the moving of a megabyte of data on every iteration of this algorithm is going to be hugely expensive. So what we might want to do in that situation is instead of a vector of data, we store a vector of pointers to data. Okay? So pointers are easier to copy, right? Because it's just, it's basically an integer. It's just a memory address. But pointers are not cache friendly because this pointer could be pointing to anywhere, right? It could be like if we just said new data and this data is living out there on the heap, then this means that the data that this is pointing to is not contiguous in memory anymore. Because for example, and I know this might not be obvious to you, but let's say I've got a vector over here Okay. And in this vector, I'm storing a bunch of pointers. And this is pointers to data. So let's say I've got three pointers. Over here, I've got my heap memory addresses. This pointer could be up here. This could be pointing to data here. Let's say that uh, fills these two addresses or whatever. This data could be right here. Right, so that might fill up uh, these three. And then this data here could be right here. Now, I've accidentally drawn these contiguously, but this data could be like down here somewhere, right? The, the point being that if you have a heap allocated memory and you have pointers to that memory in your data, and then you want to like iterate over this vector and say, do something here, then here, then here, then that data that's being pointed to may no longer be contiguous. However, if your data was so large that copying it is a problem, then it's probable that you wouldn't be able to fit more than one of them in cache anyway, so this is okay, right? So if you have very large data, it's fine to store pointers to it because you probably are not going to get any, any cache hits on large data anyway. But let's say we have integers, for example, we would not want to have a vector of pointers to integers, right? We would just want to have a vector of integers. All right. And so if this is like a vector of shared pointers, every single time you look something up, you're going to cache miss because shared pointer uses um, like the make shared uses the new operation. And so that could be absolutely anywhere. So right now, our entity, entity manager has a vector of pointers, right? And that's because we just did something that worked right away. Um, so every time we look up an entity, we're going to get a cache miss. So that's bad. We don't want that to happen. So let's talk about how we could move things around or do it a little differently. All right. So what we just talked about, here's the visualization of that. So if we store data in a vector, then what we have is contiguous data in memory, okay? So what this points to, or what this diagram is showing, is that our vector stores data. Let's, let's think that all these data here, these are integers, for example. So whenever I look some memory up, I'm going to get several of them, if it's small, in my cache. Right? So if these are integers, I'm going to get 16 of them per lookup. And so this contiguous data allows the cache to fetch multiple indices of this data at a time, which is exactly what we want. However, if we store pointers to data in our vector, the pointers themselves, like the memory addresses, will be cached, but the data they point to is probably not contiguous. So every dereference of these pointers will likely be a cache miss unless somehow magically, or if you're using some memory pooling thing that we haven't talked about yet, um, this is going to be the slower approach. Okay. Unless your data is really large. Like for example, if your cache is this big and your data is this big, well, you're not getting cache hits anyway. So you might as well store pointers to it. Okay. So ECS and caching, how can we use ECS 
to our benefit. Well, it turns out that e the structure of ECS really like, so ECS helps our programming ability, right? It helps us implement features by having these nice little systems that do things like, um, I'm going to do some movement stuff here. I'm going to do some animation stuff. Here. Uh, I'm going to do some rendering stuff here. I'm going to do some physics stuff here. So ECS helps us, the composition-based architecture of programming with ECS helps us make games easier. But it turns out it can also help us make games efficient as well. So right now, entities are used as containers for components, right? So entities currently contain all of the component data in a standard tuple, which is contiguous, right? So if you looked inside the entity class, you'd see there's a standard tuple of all the different types of components. So we've got like a transform component, then a health component, then um, an animation component, and then lifespan component or whatever. And so an entity, you can think of an entity as a vector for components, right? And all of those components are stored as raw data in the tuple. So there's no pointers going on within the entity. So the entity itself is storing these components like component one, component two, component three, component four, right in a row. So we are sure that within an entity, the component data is contiguous. That's good, that's good. So if all of our entity components fit within the cache line, then the entire entity will be cached for us. So that means that whenever we go to look up an entity, the whole entity is in the cache. So we've got the transform component, the lifespan, all of that is really good. So if I take one entity and I wanna do something to its position, and I wanna do something with its bounding box, and I wanna do something with its health, and then its lifespan, all of that stuff is in cache for me. But is that what I really want? Well, initially, that would be good. Like, it, it's better than it not being in cache, right? But is this what we really want? Let's investigate this. So here's what that would look like. Let's say I have a vector of my entity data, right? So if I have a vector of my entity data, then maybe I could get one or two entities in a cache line, right? Because maybe my entity is like 30 bytes or something like that. So if entities are stored in a vector, they are contiguous. So the cache could load multiple entities at once. However, currently, what we are actually storing is a vector of pointers to entities, right? So what we're doing right now, don't worry about it. Let's pretend that we are not storing pointers to entities. We are storing a vector of entities. It's going to end up not mattering anyway, but let's just pretend that we have a vector of raw entity data and we'll see. So if we zoom down even further, this is what that will look like. Our entities are stored contiguously, right? So in one cache line, we're going to have like a full entity. So we're going to have like component one contiguous with component two, contiguous with component three, contiguous with component four. It sounds ideal, but is this what we want again? Well, why would this matter if if entities are contiguous? All right, let's just let's just have a look forward. So storing entities contiguously initially it makes sense, right? Because maybe we can fetch multiple entities with a single with a single lookup. So maybe we could get two or even three entities in a single lookup. That would be great. However, when we talk about data oriented design and caches. Cache hits and cache misses is all about how we access the data. So you have to store things within the context of how that data will eventually be used, right? So it's okay to say, well, all our entities are, are contiguous, so that's good, we'll get a whole entity, but is that how we access data within an entity? Do we want everything of an entity at once? So how we want to access the data inside entities determines how we should store them, right? So let's look at some examples from our systems in our game, right? So we've written a bunch of gameplay systems. Let's look at 
currently, how do we access the data? And how we access the data is going to tell us how we should store the data. Let's have a look. So here's some examples. So in our movement system, we go through all of our entities and we take our transforms position and we add the velocity to it, right? Okay. Oh, all right. Well, okay. So in the movement system, we basically only deal with the transform, right? The transform component. In the rendering, um, we're drawing the sprite, right? So in the rendering, well, okay, maybe we, we just look at the sprite and we draw it. In the collisions, uh, we're looking at the bounding box and we're looking at the transform. So if I just color this a little bit, in the movement system, we're kind of only dealing with one of the components, which is the transform component. In the rendering system, we're only really dealing with the animation component. In the collision system, maybe we're dealing with bounding boxes and we're dealing with transforms, but we don't care about the lifespan, right? We don't care about the health or any of that. So ECS systems, they're really good, not only for separating functionality, but they usually only access one or two different types of components for each of the entities that we operate on. So given this access pattern, right, how we're actually accessing our data, we really want the cache to store similar components contiguously, not entire entities contiguously. Components are small. So the cache line can fit many, many more components than it could full entities. So this is what we were just looking at, right? So this is what we said before would be good if we had in one cache an entire entity. But look at that. If we, in this system, if we get the entire entity, all four of those colors, well, there's a bunch of crap in the cache that I don't even care about. So why would I do that, right? So what I would want over this is something like this. If I am only accessing the transform component or component one, so entity one, component one, entity two, component one, entity three, component one, right? If I'm looping over all of my entities and only using one of the transforms, this is what I would like to have. I would want to have all of the components of the same types stored contiguously, not entities stored contiguously. So ideally, this is what we want to have. ECS systems operate on similar components. Components being contiguous would equal more cache hits. So how could we achieve that? Because right now, we've got entities storing a bunch of different components. So we're going to introduce a memory pool. And a memory pool is a pre-allocated chunk of memory that will be used for the storage of a given data type. So for example, it could store all of our entities for us. So by pre-allocating the space for our memory pool, we could say, give me a gigabyte for all of my future entities, and we won't need to use dynamic allocations after that. However, what we might need to know is some sort of maximum size, right? So you as the game developer might say, okay, how, what's the maximum possible number of entities that I could ever have on screen and then create a memory pool for that. So here's what the memory pool might look like. It's, I've got some data, okay? Now this looks two dimensional, um, but essentially it's just like a big chunk of memory. So if we have a memory pool in which we have that first solution, which was a, vec a vector of entity data where entities are contiguous, then this is what you're going to have. So up here, we uh, on this top row, consider this to be the vector of entities. So we've got our first entity, our second entity, our third entity. And within those, all of this data, right, all of the components are contiguous, right? So this here, the first column is the first entity. The second column is the second entity, all the way up, right? So this is the first entry in our vector. This is the second entry in our vector. This is the third entry in our vector. This is the fourth entry in our vector containing all of this, all of this, all of this. Okay. So with this solution, 
the memory pool can eliminate all dynamic memory allocations by being big enough to fit all the entities, right? So if I go back here, let me just get rid of all these um, things. So if I know, for example, um, that I have, I'm only ever going to have eight entities in my game, right? Whenever I add the first entity, I can just add it right here at the beginning. When I add the second entity, I can add it right here and so on and so forth. I'm controlling where the memory is. So I don't need to say malloc, please go get me some space because I can keep track of the empty places in this memory pool really easily, okay? So the memory pool is eliminating the dynamic memory allocations. So what we're doing is we trade some upfront memory for runtime speed, right? So for example, uh, if we know that the maximum number of entities is going to be eight, but let's say our player only ended up dying really quickly and only used three of those spots, then we allocated more memory than we needed to in order to, um, in order to, to be faster. Right? So maybe we say, okay, allocate space for 10,000 entities just in case there are ever 10,000 10, entities alive, but maybe we only use 1,000 of them. Right? You're trading time or you're trading memory for time. And this works really well for known hardware, um, but it, it also works pretty well for unknown hardware. Right? So if you know exactly like how many entities you're going to create and how much space this will take up, this works really great. When a new entity is created, all we need to do is just go through the, the memory pool and find an empty spot for it in the table. And then we put our new entity there. And this is much, much faster than malloc in practice. So for example, all we would have to do is scan left to right for available space. When an entity dies, you mark it as available and that's it. You can save time. You don't even have to free memory if you don't want to. And I'll show you an example of that in a bit. So this is how a memory pool, that's essentially how it works and how you can use it to eliminate dynamic memory allocations. However, instead of storing vectors of entities, let's instead have a vector for each component type. So before what we had was a vector and each column was an entity. Okay, and those entity data were contiguous in memory. But now let's change it so that rows are vectors. Okay, and so the components will now be contiguous. So this is what we're going to have now. So each of these rows is a vector of the component type. So this here, no longer, we, we no longer have a vector of entity, we know how, sorry, we no longer have entities storing all the data. Somewhere in our memory pool, we have a vector of component ones, a vector of component twos, a vector of component threes, and a vector of component fours. So that all, each component is living contiguous to each other. Okay. If that, if that's not clear, just rewind the, the video a bit and just listen to that again. So we have a vector of each type of component. So what is an entity now? If the entity doesn't store the data, what is an entity? Well, the entity is just the index into these vectors, right? So if you want to get the, uh, the component two of entity two, then all you need to do is look up index two of the component two array. And we'll show you how, I'll show you how I do that in a second. So each entity ID is the index into the vector for each component. And so now each component is stored con contiguously. And a really cool side product of this is that now our entity is just an index. That's literally all an entity is. The entity class will no longer store its components as member data. In fact, the entity will have no member data other than an integer index. So the entity is essentially just an index. It's a wrapper around an index into those things. But the entity functions will cooperate with our memory pool and know how to look up that memory pool data and access the associated index. So how in the hell do we implement this, right? Like, how would we do that? Well, it's not that difficult. So before, each 
entity had a tuple of components, right? So the entity stored a tuple component one, tuple com or a tuple of component one, component two, component three, component four. But now what we have is a memory pool where inside the memory pool, we have a something called the entity component vector tuple, where we have a tuple of vectors to components. All right, so we have a vector for transforms. We have a vector for lifespans. We have a vector for healths. We have a vectors for whatever, okay? So we have a bunch of these vectors, or uh, we have a tuple of a bunch of these vectors. And if we ever want to get access to a particular entity's component of a given type, then we can access it from this data structure with the following syntax. So for example, if I wanted to get component two of a given entity, then I can use standard get. So we standard get on that data and we pass in a given type. And that type that we want is a standard vector of type T, which would be component two. And we look it up in the tuple and then we index it by the entity ID, right? So let's just have like, let's look at a small example of that. Let's say this is our vector of component twos. Right, let's say we got six of them. So our memory pool is of size six. And this vector exists for each of the for each of these. I'm just showing it for, for component two. So let's say we have an entity and the ID of the entity is equal to three. All right. So what this code down here says is standard get. Okay, so we want to get something from the tuple. So we want to get component two. So we'll pass in standard vector of component two. So it will look up this vector right here. And so it looks it up in this data structure that we have, like this is the actual tuple that we've set up. And then that returns a vector and we go, okay, this is index zero, one, two, three. And so entity with ID three, component two lives in this part of the data. Okay, so standard get, standard vector t data at a given index, that is how we get this data. That's how you can implement it in C++. In a different language, you may have to implement this differently, but using templates and tuples, we can do this with zero overhead in C++, okay? So our entity memory pool then stores this data essentially. So our entity memory pool is gonna store some data like here's the total number of entities that we have. Um, here's, here's the actual pool of components, right? So this is the entity component vector tuple. That's this data structure that we just made. It's also going to store a vector of strings for the tags, and it's going to store a vector of Booleans for whether or not it's active. And then um, down here, we're going to, this is going to be a singleton. So our memory pool um, is going to be, uh, we talked about singletons, I think, already in the course. I hopefully, so it's a way to ensure that only one instance of this class exists, okay? So we set up a static memory pool and we return a reference to that. All right. So inside our entity memory pool, we have functionality that lets us get um, an entity's component of a given type or other entity data such as the tag or whether or not it's active. So the code for that is like this. Inside memory pool, I would have a templated function on type name T, which says, okay, so this is called get component and we pass in an entity ID. So like an entity ID number three would be passed in here for the entity with ID three. And we would say standard get standard vector of type T on M data, which is that tuple. And then we, that's a vector. So we look up that indices, or the, that index, which is the, the vector, the entity ID, apologies. Similarly, if I wanted to get the tag for a given entity, well, that one's a lot easier because I just have a vector of strings, which are the tags. And down here, I would just say, okay, well, I look up the tags by the entity ID. Then over in the entity class, right? The entity class literally just stores an ID now, but it still has the same functions. 
So it still has get component, it still has has component, it still has remove component. And so even though we have dramatically changed how everything is stored under the hood, we don't need to change how we use entities because how we use entities is exactly the same. The interface to that hasn't changed. So if we want to get a component of a particular type from an entity, we would ask the memory pool, we get the instance of the memory pool, and then we say, get the component of the type for my ID. So there's this huge number of arrays over in the memory pool, and the memory pool knows how to get specific data. So if you wanted to get, for example, the transform, here, the entity is saying, hey, memory pool, please get me the transform component, which is in the vector of those transforms indexed by my ID. Okay, so I know it's a little bit complicated. Luckily, you don't have to implement this for the course. This is just for your learning benefit, right? And then inside the entity manager class, um, whenever I go to add a new entity, I now need to change that code a little bit because I'm no longer just creating an entity by creating a new shared pointer. I actually have to put that in a specific spot in my entity memory pool. Now, and if I'm going a little fast here, I have a, I have a dia, I have a, like an illustrated example that will make all this code pretty easy in a little bit. So what you would have to do now inside entity manager is because the entity memory pool is now in charge of everything. You have to ask the entity memory pool, Hey, add me an entity put it somewhere, and then return this to me. The really cool thing about all this is that now, because an entity is just an ID, you can store raw entities in your vector because entities are just integers. They're just the index. And so you no longer ever have to pass entities by reference. You can pass them by value because you're only ever copying the ID. So it makes Every aspect of this so much faster and so much cooler. And then in the entity memory pool, the way we actually add an entity is by scanning forward in our memory pool to find the next index of the pool where you could have this thing, right? So we'd have to set all of the vectors of that particular index if equal to like a new uh, component. And then you set the tag and you set the active equal to their defaults. And then you return the entity, which is indexed by that index. So when we create the memory pool, we have many copies of a blank default constructed component of each given type. And remember, each component has a Boolean associated with it, whether or not a given entity actually contains that component. So entity also has an active Boolean to say whether or not an entity is being uh, it, whether or not it's alive. So we can use all of this data now in an example. So here's what an initial ECS memory pool might look like. So we have a vector for all of our component ones. We have a vector for all of our component twos. We have a vector for all of our component threes. We have a vector for all of our tags for our entities. And we have a vector for, what, for all of our um, our booleans to say whether or not this entity is currently alive. Okay. So up here, each of our component is going to have some default value, right? Maybe it's location zero or whatever the default value for it is. This might be this zero over here. And it also has a Boolean value saying whether or not this entity currently has this component added to it. Right? So let's look at how this is going to look. When we want to put a new entity into the memory pool, we have to find a location for it within the pool. So the simplest way is we can just scan from the beginning of the pool to the end of the pool to find the first location of a non-active entity and then put it in that slot. So let's look at how that works. Here we have our initially blank memory pool. Okay, there's currently nothing in it. And we say entity P equals entity manager dot add entity P. So all we've done here is we've said, I want a new entity and it has the tag of P, right? So what has happened is that we're going to look up from left to right, 
and we're going to find the first space in our entity memory pool, the first index where the active flag is set to false, because that means that there's no currently alive entity in that spot. So I scan over and I find, oh, okay, at index zero, the first thing I checked, it was false. So now this entity is active and it has a, a tag of P, okay? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add a component to this entity. So what I do is I'm going to add a C1 component to that entity. And what that does is when I construct that component, it sets the flag to true to say that, hey, this entity actually has a C1 component. So if, I'm, if this is a bounding box, for example, I can still poll to see whether or not this entity has this bounding box. And then I can say, um, oh, I changed the font. One second. I'm just going to change this font so the slides are still fine. Why can't I find the font? There we go. So I've added the component now. Now let's give it some sort of value. So P, uh, P's C1 component, I changed the value to seven. And so now here's what the memory pool looks like. There's a C1, it exists, it has a value of seven, that entity has a tag of P, and active has a value of true. Now, let's add another entity, right? So my entity manager scans, or my memory pool scans left to right, it sees, okay, there's no, uh, there's, no uh, there's a T here in entity zero, so I can't put it there, but there's an F in entity one. Right, so I can put my new entity there and it gives it a value of Q for the tag. Now I'm gonna add a C2 component and I'm gonna give that a value of three. Um, then what I can do is let's say now I want to remove the C2 component from E1. So I call component c 2 and all it has to do is set the true to a false, right? So some of my components might be a little bit complex. Before what I had to do was essentially destroy that component, calling that component's destructor, which may be, um, it might be expensive, right? But all I need to do here is just set this one Boolean to false, and it doesn't matter if I leave this data here because I'm no longer using that data because it's marked as not having that component. So this can help me a lot when I go to like remove components from things. So here's what I have now. Now what I can do is let's say I go to destroy the first entity. So if I say p.destroy, which is the first entity, all I need to do is mark it as false. I don't need to change the tag. I don't need to go up here and remove all the components. I don't need to do anything like that because it has all just been, like I'm never accessing this again, right? So I don't even need to call destructors anymore. This is how efficient this is. Now, if I then go to like put another entity in here, well, it's gonna see that the first place is false. So if I do overwrite it, well, then I should probably call the default constructors on these things, right? And then if I add component C3 to here, then all I need to do is, is change this to true, okay? So, and this would go on and on and I'd keep adding entities, etc. Now, it turns out that a much more efficient way than just scanning left to right all the time is just to keep track of the last place that I inserted an entity. If I keep track of the last place that I inserted an entity, then it's pretty likely that the next time I go to create an entity, I can just put it in the next place and nothing will be there, right? So that's what you can do a lot of the time is do that. Uh, all right. So now what I have is I have all of this red data is contiguous in memory. All of this green data is contiguous in memory. The blue data is contiguous in memory and the red data, again, is contiguous in memory. And so the memory pool has eliminated all of my dynamic allocations. It's made the adding and removing of components much faster. 
It's made the adding and removing of entities much faster. It's made all of my component data contiguous, right? So pretty cool. Um, I had a question out there that said, will gaps in the component array ruin the continuous access pattern? It can, okay? So for example, if I have true, true, false, 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 true, right? Then I do have a gap here. But in practice, what I've found is if you're overwriting the previous locations of allocated um, entities, right? Then all, your data is staying fairly clumped anyway. So you will, I think you will find in pattern that you won't, that you will have like large clumps of data such that most of your data in the, in the components are contiguous. Uh, I had another question up here. Okay, that question isn't necessarily relevant. Okay, so that's what memory pools do for us. And it's really cool. And I have implemented this into the assignment three engine. And let me tell you that in situations, especially, especially where you are uh, adding and removing many entities, like I had at the beginning of the class, um, this example here, now excuse the frame rate about to drop. Uh, this example here was done using memory pooling. And I got something like 60,000 entities per second being created and destroyed, absolutely no problem. Whereas when we were doing it with the shared pointer, um, as our current um, assignment is, is using, it was maybe like a thousand, right? So huge speed up in the access time. Someone else asked, how would you keep track of the gaps? I assume once it becomes large enough, it'll be useful to have uh, some track it rather than just linear search. Yes, of course. So you can put all sorts of clever ways of keeping track of the gaps in here, right? So I'm not going to go through them. I'm sure you can look them up. Scanning left to right, it just works, trademark. So that's the first thing you would do. You would get it to just work then you would try and come up with more clever things, right? Maybe you keep track of where you've deleted things and you can replace things, right? So there's lots of things that you can do here, but you don't want the solutions to that problem to be the bottleneck for this, right? So just be careful with that. Um, okay, so if you are watching this uh, on uh, the 16th, make sure that you are sitting, submitting your project proposals tonight because they are due. So uh, that's all I had for this lecture and we are right on time. So thank you all for tuning in and uh, I'll see you in the next one.